ya Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanye Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Recording in progress. So we're continuing our study of the uh, 10th canto, chapter number 20, descriptions of rainy season and autumn. This is um, for the Bhakti Vedanta. Right? Okay, so I'll share the screen. I wanted to show you some pictures uh, because I said that. There's a, some of these texts have all been illustrated in the light of the Bhagavad. So, here's one. Can you see it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Can you see it now? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, so, this is about the, the text we studied yesterday. I'll just read the... Uh, description the lightning becomes unsteady in its friendship failing to remain faithfully in any one of the clouds although they are the friends of the entire world just as lusty women do not remain steady even in the company of men who possess excellent qualities so this was the illustration for that particular text. And there was one more I wanted to show you. We're going to go on today to do this next text here. Can you see it all right? Yes, Maharaj. You can see it? Okay, good. Uh, would somebody like to read it? Yes, Maharaj. In the midst of the thunder, in the cloudy, cloudy sky, there appears a rainbow that is no stream. Its appearance is compared to the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead or His servants in the midst of the material atmosphere. Okay, so you can see the rainbow there. So this was the illustration done for that particular text. Okay, we'll go back to Srimad Bhagavatam. And we're on this text number 18 about the bow. We didn't read this one yet. I'll just read the translation. When the curved bow of Indra the rainbow appeared in the sky which had the quality of thundering sound it was unlike ordinary bows because it did not rest upon a string similarly when the supreme lord appears in this world which is the interaction of the material qualities he is unlike ordinary persons because he remains free from all material qualities 
and independent of all material conditions. So the rainbow is compared to the bow, and shaped like a bow. The only difference being that there's no string on the bow. Yeah, usually when you have a bow, you have, you have a string there and it bends the bow, holds the bow in shape. And so this rainbow, there's no string. The, the string is also sometimes known as guna. Guna means rope or string. And so this is applied to the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That when the Lord appears in this world, he is not subject to any of the modes of the material world. Right? I've marked it here at the end of the purport. Similarly, when the Supreme Personality of Godhead descends to this material world, he appears just like an ordinary human being, but he is not resting on any material conditions. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, that he appears by his internal potency, which is free from the bondage of the external potency. What is bondage for the ordinary creatures is freedom for the personality of Godhead. So we're the ordinary creatures and we're in bondage <laughs> due to the material potency. We're under the control of the material energy, but the Lord is transcendental, just like the bow has no, no string, no gunas. And so this is a comparison there in that text. We'll go ahead. 19. During the rainy season, the moon was, present, was prevented from appearing directly by the covering of the clouds which were themselves illuminated by the moon's rays. Similarly, the living being in material existence is prevented from appearing directly by the covering of the false ego, which is itself illuminated, illumined by the consciousness of the pure soul. So the example is given here about how the clouds cover the moon. So the, the light from the moon has to come through the clouds. And this, this is compared to the living entity. We're all spirit souls and our spirit soul is covered by the false ego. So our actual, the, the, of course the nature of the soul is Satchitananda, eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. So that bliss and knowledge that comes through the covering of the false ego. And we are identifying like that. We are identifying with the material body. We are thinking our, ourselves in many different ways, different designations of the body. So this is due to the consciousness which is being per, uh, reflected through the covering. So the covering of the moon and the covering of the, the soul compared to each other. Just at the end of the purport we'll read, the clouds appear luminous because they are filtering and impeding the brilliant rays of the moon. Similarly, at times, material consciousness appears pleasurable or enlightened because it is screening or filtering the original blissful and enlightened consciousness coming directly from the soul. And Ridainanda Maharaj has added a sentence here at the end. He said, if one can understand the ingenious analogy given in this verse, we can easily advance in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, it's a nice analogy, comparing the consciousness and how the moon is covered, the light of the moon is reflected and the consciousness of the soul is reflected. Okay.
We'll go ahead. Number 20. The peacocks become festive and cried out a joyous, a joyful greeting when they saw the clouds arrive. And just as people distressed in household life feel pleasure when the pure devotees of the infallible Supreme Lord visit them. This is an interesting example. <laughs> The, the visit of the pure devotees to the homes of the grihastas, the people who are dis distressed in householder life when they're visited by the pure devotees, then the people in householder life, they feel very happy. They, 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 and they, they, they call out in joy. And it's compared to the peacocks who cry out when they see the clouds arrive. And at the end of the purport here they mention, uh, We have practical experience of this. Many of our students were dry and morose previously to their coming to Krishna Consciousness. But having come into contact with devotees, they are now dancing like jubilant peacocks. So it's very nice. Dancing like jubilant peacocks. We hope you have a lot of people dancing like jubilant peacocks there. Eh? This is the idea. So, the peacocks are very happy when they see the clouds arrive. They're going to bring the rain and cool everything. And the clouds are happy. There will be more peacocks will find more food to eat when the rain comes. It will be easier for them to survive. And the same way the people are happy when the devotees, pure devotees, will come to visit them. And this is actually the business of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, that we, we are meant to go door to door and talk to the people and encourage them and enlighten them in spiritual knowledge. We know that material life, life in the material world is really not easy. It's not easy for anyone, especially at this time. And we're going through very difficult stages and some people are really finding life very difficult. So it's really, in, it's, it's very good for us to go out and meet the people and try to enlighten them, to give them some Krishna consciousness. We, went, we want to go door to door and tell everyone, just like Lord Chaitanya told Lord Nichananda and Hari Das, right? Tell the people, read the books about Krishna, worship Krishna, and chant the holy name of Krishna. So this is our, this is our business as devotees. And we hope that the, devote, the people will be happy to see us. Of course, it's not always like that, but we have to try. There's no failure in Krishna consciousness. We make the attempt, try to go out and give Krishna consciousness to others. We may fail, we may not be successful, it may appear like we failed, but making the attempt itself is glorious. And there are people who like to have devotees come and visit them. They're happy to have the devotees come to see them. How about you, Srinivas Gopal Prabhu? Do you find it like that in where you're preaching now? Are people receptive? Yes, Maharaj. 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 Yes, Maharaj.
peop and people like you to come to their homes and preach yes. to them? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Good. Yeah, we want to reach out. This is, you know, outreach. We talk about outreach preaching, going out, going to people, trying to give Krishna consciousness to more people. There's people everywhere, and Prabhupada told us devotees of Krishna are everywhere, just waiting for us, waiting for us to come there, to find them, to preach to them. So we should be enthusiastic. Okay, we'll go ahead, text 21. The trees had grown thin and dry, but after they drank the newly fallen rainwater through their feet, their various bodily features blossomed. Similarly, one whose body has grown thin and weak from austerity again exhibits his healthy bodily features upon enjoying the material objects gained through that austerity. So we're, we're hearing about the rainy season. So before the rainy season was the very long dry season, the hot summer, and the trees had grown thin and dry. And this is compared to the, the yogi or the, the one who's doing some austerity. He, when you do something like maybe you're doing some fasting for some reason, then you become thin and weak. But then when the rain comes, then the tree begins to blossom and bring, be, grows nicely and flowers will be there and green leaves and everything. So in the same way, the person who's doing austerity, he's thin and weak, but then when he gets the result of his austerities, then he begins enjoying that the results of that. So of course we don't want to do austerity just for material reasons. In the purport, I think it's obviously written by Ridayananda Maharaj because he talks about life in America and he talks about the politicians in America, how politicians undergo grueling austerities while traveling about the countryside, campaigning for election. Yeah, in USA, when they have, before elections, they will spend a lot of money and they'll go everywhere. They have to go around the whole country and give a lot of speeches to get support for the election. So it's a great austerity. And then he also talks about businessmen also will often deny personal comfort to make their business successful. Such austere persons, upon acquiring the fruits of their austerity, again become healthy and satisfied, like trees eagerly drinking rainwater after enduring the austerity of a dry, hot summer. So appropriate examples, people do, they do, they, they do have a, a, austere, a lot of austerities in their life, that's mentioned the businessmen and politicians, not only them, I, there's a lot of other people who have a lot of austerities in their life. People working in factories, some people even also working in the fields, the farmers, they work in the fields, it's hot, sometimes it's out there and they're hot, it's hot, sometimes it's cold, but they're out there every day working, there's austerities there. And similarly, devotees also, devotees do austerities, going out on book distribution. Now in the winter time, devotees going out, it's you know, not very easy, they're cold, and then they have to go out there and meet people, and people often not very friendly, though they have to tolerate so much austerity. But if you do that austerity for the purpose of spreading Krishna consciousness, 
then that's very glorious. So we, we appreciate that. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 22. I'm going to hear about the cranes. The cranes, the birds, these birds, the cranes. So the cranes continued dwelling on the shores of the lakes, although the shores were agitated during the rainy season, just as materialistic persons with contaminated minds always remain at home despite the many disturbances there. So this example is given by Sukadeva Goswami. Cranes, we see these birds uh, in, in here in Mayapur, I see them almost every day. These cranes are here and they're flying around looking, particularly when a tractor comes or when people come with the plow to do some plowing, then the cranes will be there because that's the time when they're going to get some worm or something, get some food for themselves. But generally also, they like to sit by the side of a lake and it's not very easy for them. There's a lot of discomfort there. There's things like stones there and there will be so many garbage and long grasses and whatever. So, so many disturbances will be there. But the, crone, the, the crane will continue sitting there and it's compared to people who are in family life and who are having difficult time in family life. Maybe their home is, there's a lot of agitation, a lot of complaining and quarreling going on all the time. In the purport it's describing here, a materialistic man never even considers leaving his family in the hands of his grown sons and going away for spiritual improvement. He regards such an idea as shocking and uncivilized because he is completely ignorant of the absolute truth and his relationship in that truth. So this is a common situation, material world. People are not uh, so much uh, familiar with the Vedic culture. And even if they know the Vedic culture, they think, that, well, that was in the past. It's not like that now. And as mentioned in the purport, people even will condemn the, the Vedic system. Vedic system is that you should get out from the home. Particularly, we see in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the example is there, in Dhritarashtra, he was at home and Vidura came to get him out from the home. So there's often, dis even uh, Vid it was Vidura who was able to let Dhritarashtra understand how fallen his position was, that he was living there in the home of the enemy, the Pandava's home, and he was eating the remnants of Bhima, and Bhima had killed all of his 100 sons, but still Dhritarashtra was eating the food of Bhima. And so Vidura pointed these things out to Dhritarashtra and he also pointed out about the, the condition of his physical body, how his body was near to death and he lost all the powers of digestion and he was blind from birth and he was blind spiritually and all of his other organs were also losing his powers. He could not hear, could not see proper, he couldn't see at all, could not hear well. And certainly so many inconveniences are there with old age. So this is a sign that we need to get out from the house. We need to get away from the home and we need to prepare for leaving the body. That's important. We have to prepare for the next life. But still people, they, they won't do it. They don't want to do it. They want to just stay there. They think, no, my family need me. 
and I have to stay here. So it's a rare soul who is able to detach himself from the material situation. So this example of the cranes is very applicable in the modern society. How can we present this to people today? Is it, is it a good idea to encourage people in this principle of Varnashram? You know, the Vedas say, from the age of 50, Panchasurvam Vanambrajit, go to forest. Is, it, is, that, is that a good way to preach to people today? Do you think? What, would, what do you think, Maharaj Ji? Huh? Uh, we can always encourage him to take up the devotionals uh, wherever they are rather than leaving the house and going away. We should just encourage them in devotional service. Yes, we should encourage them. Can we encourage them to go to temple? Yeah, we can tell them to go to temple. It's not that they give up everything and go away. Mm -hmm. But they can stay wherever they are and they can actually give up their responsibility to their uh, children. But they can uh, do more of devotional service. Uh -huh. They need to study Srimad Bhagavatam, right? Yes, Maharaj. They need to read the books. Yes, and take up chanting the holy name. Of course, for people in old age, maybe they, they're not accustomed to read books. They, they never read much books. It's difficult for, and our books are also sometimes difficult for people to read. They're not familiar with the language, the philosophy which is presented may be difficult for them. But certainly chanting the holy name and doing some service is very important. To do some, get them to do some service for the, for the devotees, for the temple. And just like there was one devotee, there was one devotee, he was staying in Vrindavan. Of course, he was a renunciate, he was a single man. And he, he came to stay in the Krishna Balaram temple at the opening of the temple. His name was Vibhu Chaitanya. I don't know if you know him, but he was a very great soul. And so he came in Prabhupada's time and he took on the responsibility to cook for the deities. And he would cook every offering every day. And he did this for many years. He was cooking every day, every offering. And Prabhupada told him that when you're cooking, you can also chant. You do your chanting in that time. Uh, so he, he did that service for many years and he was always chanting and he was always blissful and happy and he loved to give the prasad, distribute prasadam to the devotees. Gradually however his body failed and he was no longer able to keep doing the service so he took up another service and he would sit and give charanamrita every day. And people would come and take Charanamrita and with great devotion he would put drops of Charanamrita in people's hands and then he would wash their hand and he would dry their hand for them. <laughs> so he was really, he was really a very nice, wonderful devotee. And he left the world now, they have, a, I think his Samadhi is there in Vrindavan, it's not far from the Krishna Balaram Mandir. But that's a, a very nice example. We definitely want to try to be engaged in some service, even if we can't get out from the home, try to not get too much involved in the family affairs. As Madhiji said, you know, hand over everything to the, the sons. Mentioned here that the sons are grown up, so let them take charge, let them be responsible. The sons are there. Let them have, take the, the home and be responsible. And your, the older man's business is simply to focus on devotional service and to prepare for the next life. You shouldn't have to worry about any other responsibilities. Is that fair? 
All right, we'll go ahead. Text 23. When Indra sent forth his rains, the flood waters broke through the irrigation dikes in the agricultural fields. Just as in Kali Yuga, the atheists' false theories break down the boundaries of Vedic injunctions. There's no purport here, but if we look in the light of the Bhagavad, there is some purport in relation to this verse. And Prabhupada did write about this, because as you can imagine, it's, it's talking about something, something which is very uh, important for us as devotees, the, the Kali Yuga and the atheist false theories have broke down the boundaries of Vedic injunctions. So the, in Prabhupada's purport, in the light of the Bhagavad, he, gives me, he lists many examples of these atheistic false theories. Hmm. Can you think of some of them? What are some of these atheistic false theories which break down the boundaries of Vedic injunctions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Uh, they say that we all come from, humans come from monkeys, uh, like that. So then God's existence is effectively annihilated. There's no God. You know? Okay, so that's, so, you're, you're present, you're talking about the evolution theory, Darwin? Darwin. Evolution theory, yeah. The, the life is simply evolution. We've evolved from the lower species. What does the Vedas say? Where do we come from? We are part and parcel of Krishna. We are his marginal energy. Currently, we are in touch with the inferior energy. And if we chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra, then we come in touch with the superior energy. So does, uh, does, it, does life come about from from the lower species to the higher species? Sorry, Mara. Is, is the life actually coming from the lower species? Does it come about from the lower species that gradually will come to the higher species? No, no. All the species come from God. And do they all come together at the same time? Yes, yes. My understanding is all the different types of living beings are all parts and parcels of Krishna. That's why we don't kill and eat them. They are as much souls as we are. Well, certainly it's true that we're all part and parcel of Krishna. We're all souls. But uh, the actual explanation of the origin of life, it, it said that it's not coming from the lower species to the higher species, but rather it's from the higher species to the lower species. It's just the opposite, that we've got Lord Brahma on top, you know, Lord Brahma's there, and he's creating the bodies, you know, and different demigods, we hear about the different demigods, and then they help also with the creation, and from uh, Kashyapa Muni, he produced, uh, uh, is it Kashyapa, yeah? Kashyapa and Aditi, they produce so many different species of life. And so the, rather, it's just the opposite from what the materialistic, atheistic people claim. The, evolution, the, the, the life actually comes from the higher species down to lower species. But there are many examples of uh, prominent uh, so-called so religious movements which actually present atheistic ideas and uh, go against the Vedic injunctions. Can you name some of them? Um, yes, please. Maharaj, one more uh, oh, philosophy, the Mayavad is present, uh, you know, which uh, often times Shila Prabhupada refers is uh, Jethomar Tato Path. Okay, whatever is your thought, that is the right path. You know, you can do whatever, finally we'll uh, go back home. You know, that's the one philosophy that presents, which is, uh, which is not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Vrata and Lord says, whatever we need to do, we will be able to do it. So, you know, like whatever we are doing, we will attain that destination. So, this, this is the wrong philosophy which uh, contemporary is my own is different. Uh-huh. Well, that's a, a particular uh, philosophy which they're presenting. It doesn't have a, any particular name. It's not known as any particular tradition or anything. But that's, that's their idea, yes. But there are a number of different sectarian groups who have their own ideas, their own atheistic philosophies. And they're, much, they're very much against the very conjunctions, but at the same time, they're well known around the world. And Prabhupada gives examples, he names some of them, like uh, he talks about Buddhism. Buddhism is against uh, the Vedas, of course. Buddhism rejects the Vedas. And then also you have Patanjali Yoga. Patanjali Yoga Sutras and people follow the path of Patanjali, that's also impersonalism. Patanjali didn't actually mention the Absolute Truth. It was like he knew there was an Absolute Truth, but he kept it covered. And then you have also the atheistic Kapila, that's also prominent. When we speak about Sankhya philosophy, people will talk about Kapila. But they don't mean Devahuti Kapila. They're talking about the atheist Kapila. His philosophy is the one which is well known, which is recognized by materialistic scientists and philosophers in, in the Western world particularly. And so there are many other different groups also similar to this. And Prabhupada, in, in his purport, in the light of the Bhagavad, he has a long list. I'll just try to find it for you. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, Huh? Light of Bhagavad 20. 20, is it? Thank you, Prabhu. Oh, I think it should be 19, actually. No, I have seen 20. Is it? Really? Okay. The last, last part. Yes. Yes, right. Okay, yes, here we have, yeah. And, and Prabhupada mentions here, over the course of time, the Vedic path has been attacked by philosophers like Charvaka, Buddha, Arhat, Kapila, Patanjali, Shankara, Vaikarna, Jaimini, Nayakatas, Vaishashikas, the Sagunas, the Empiricists, the Pashupata Saivas, the Saguna Saivas, the Brahmanas, the Aryas, and many others. The list of non-Vedic speculators grows daily without restriction. The path of the Vedas does not accord with any principle devoid of an eternal relationship with God, attainment of his devotional service, and culmination in transcendental love for him. So Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada appreciated this, he certainly appreciated and you can see it particularly in Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra when we offer, when Prabhupada was asked, you know the devotees they wanted to, they, they only had one Pranam Mantra for Prabhupada and so they saw that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he had four Pranam Mantras so they requested Prabhupada, Prabhupada we should have another Pranam Mantra for you, at least there should be another one, should be two. And so the devotees, they didn't know Sanskrit, so Prabhupada personally composed the second prayer. Namaste Sarasati Devi Goravani Precharini Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarini. So Prabhupada was, in that prayer, he's describing his mission 
to preach against these non-Vedic philosophies, Nirvishesha and the Shunyavada, these things, very prominent around the world. And in the Western world, Prabhupada wanted to give them Lord Chaitanya's message to bring people to a Krishna consciousness. Hmm. Okay, so coming back to Srimad Bhagavatam here. Mm. These atheists here, where well, I've colored this, these atheists are all against the revealed scriptures because such persons are intimately attached to sense pleasure and gross materialism. There are also others who do not believe in the eternity of life. So Prabhupada is explaining the real problem here, that these people are very attached to sense gratification and uh, gross materialism. And they, he, he, even some don't believe in the eternity of life. So Charvaka is there, like that. They don't believe in the eternity of life. And Buddhists also, they don't believe in the eternity of life. They don't even believe in life, actually. They say life is, no. Life is uh, just simply illusion. They believe everything is nothing, ultimately nothing. So like that, there's different philosophies all promoting these atheistic ideas. So we have to preach against it. The path of the Vedas does not accord with any principle devoid of an eternal relationship with God, attainment of his devotional service and culmination in transcendental love for him. So this is our Krishna Consciousness Movement to actually bring people to that stage of recognizing their relationship with God. And then practicing, so there's Sambandha, Abhidaya and Prayojana, culminating in transcendental love for Him. So Prabhupada is just identifying the three stages, Sambandha, Abhidaya and Prayojana, as they're mentioned. I should be in the Bhagavatam, right? <laughs> All right, so we spoke about the cranes. Are, are, are you seeing the Srimad Bhagavatam okay? Yes, Maharaj. Srimad Bhagavatam, can to them. Okay, we have you on the right, I'm on the right page, right? Okay, text number 23. When Indra sent forth his rains, the flood waters broke through the irrigation dikes in the agricultural field. Did I read this one? Yes, we just read that one, right? 23. We finished that one, right? There was no purport, so we went to light of the Bhagavad. We'll go ahead to text 24. The clouds, impelled by the winds, released their nectarian water for the benefit of all living beings. Just as kings, instructed by their brahmana priests, dispense charity to the citizens. This is a nice situation. So the clouds, are carrying the water and the wind is quite strong so the winds are blowing blowing the clouds around and the clouds carry the water and pour the water for the benefit of all living beings and so they're compared to the kings of course we don't have kings today but we do have kshatriyas well we do have rich people we have the the wealthy people you know the industrialists and businessmen and so on. So these kind of people 
they're, they're instructed by their brahmana priests to give charity to the citizens. We see in the Vedic culture that what was the real problem with Varnashram? Why was it rejected? Why did it fail in India? What was the cause of the breakdown of the Varnashram system? The Brahmanas were not qualified. Uh, so they misguided the uh, other group of other classes. Unqualified Brahmanas, right? What was it? Why were they not qualified? What were they doing? Madhiji, Madhiji, you're speaking. You they, they started. Uh, they started taking all the credit for themselves. They were exhibiting some sense of superiority, which is true. But uh, they they thought that they deserved that uh, credit. So instead of worshipping God, they wanted the lower class to worship them. And they, they became more ritualistic than devotional. Uh, so they were guiding people into rituals without actually ta talking about that. I am one for ritual principles. Sorry, what's happening there? Yes, Hare Krishna. They were they were more ritualistic than devotional Maharaj. Right, right. Okay, they were more into the rituals. Why were they into the rituals? Uh, it it gave them material benefit. Right. They got lot of uh, charity. Yeah, and, they wanted the money. Right, economic development. Yeah. Their focus was more on material prosperity, right, than the actual mood. What should the actual mood of the Brahmana be? They should teach everyone to be a devotee of Krishna. They should show them the path towards Krishna. Well, that's, <laughs> that's our own philosophy, but in general, you know, in the Vedic culture, what should be actually the, the qualification of the Brahmana? How, what should be his nature? They do yajna, uh, yajna, yajna, patan. They, they okay. give knowledge, they accept, uh, they study and they give knowledge. Uh, they accept charity, they give charity, they perform uh, sacrifices and they teach others to also perform sacrifices for satisfying mission. Okay, good. Yes, this is the six occupations of the Brahmana. And sometimes it jokingly remarked that in the Kali Yuga, the Brahmanas are expert in only one of these six activities. Right? What would that be, Mataji? Accepting charity. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> good at accepting the charity, but we don't necessarily give charity out, we don't teach, we don't practice. So these are problems. Yeah, corruption and degradation of the Brahminical culture was a problem. But as mentioned here, the Brahmanas, they had a duty, they had a duty to perform, right? The society is divided into these four different varnas, and there's meant to be cooperation between them. But as Mataji mentioned, the Brahmanas developed a mode of superiority. And the result was they got, op there was opposition naturally. The class of people felt neglected and not, not cared for, you know, particularly the working class. We see, for example, how there's uh, the socialism or communism which is being propagated and it was also there in India for some time. It may still be. Is it still in India? Do we still have communism active in India? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, there are two states. Two states which are ruled by Communist Party, yeah? Uh, West Bengal as well as Kerala. They're dominated by these uh, communists. Uh -huh. So uh, we see, wh why is it these 
groups have come up. This is, you know, com communism. Why is it? It came up in India, which is Bharata Bhumi, which is Punya Bhumi, where the Vedic culture had been established. But this uh, atheistic philosophy came up. And one of the problems was the agitation between the, the working class and the intellectuals. Working class meaning like the sudra, you know, the labourer, the workers, they were considered low class and the brahmanas were considered supposed to be high class. So this was a problem, the friction between the two different classes of people. Now what the brahmanas were meant to do is described here. You see the brahmanas, what, what are they meant to do? It's described here. Maybe someone can tell me. Yes, what are they meant to be doing, the brahmanas? Can you say Maharaj? Yes, please, Prabhu. Yeah. But first of all, Brahmana should be compassionate and they should embrace all other uh, people of all other classes as well. When they become arrogant, uh, they invite rebel. So they should be uh, treating everyone with honor and compassionately guiding the rest of the society. Okay, guiding, but what should be actually done? You, you, you know, you're mentioning some not very specific things. They should be teaching, they should be teaching. Yes, that's good, they should be teaching. But here in this particular text, it's mentioned they should be doing something else a little bit. They, they should perform sacrifices and distribute wealth equally. Much. Yes. So they inspire the, the kings and... Uh, and the wealthy market men community. Yeah, they're meant to actually inspire the rich men and the wealthy community to give charity, to perform great sacrifices. So can you see this in our Krishna consciousness movement? Are we doing this? Do we perform this function in our Krishna consciousness movement? Yes, Maharaj, very much. Yeah, we do. Yeah, very live much. in Kolkata, Maharaj. That's what we do all the time. Right, yeah. When I was in Calcutta, I stayed in Calcutta in the 1970s. I was there for a couple of years and we were regularly going to visit the industrialists and the wealthy people and encouraging them to support our Krishna consciousness movement. And we see also devotees in Delhi and Mumbai and actually all over the country that we, we do uh, encourage the wealthy people, the industrialists and businessmen, that they should support our Krishna consciousness movement and they should give charity to help to perform different yagyas and do things like building big temples particularly. That's a very great charity. You know, we can, if we look at our yatra here in India today, we see a lot of projects are going on. You know, we have the, as well as the TOVP, which is a, the main project really, it's the international project. But then we have also, we have the, in Calcutta you have the, well you have landed the new Calcutta, and so you're developing there. And then you have also Prabhupada's birthplace, which we've recently acquired. And then you have also Uta Danga, where Prabhupada met Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. So just in Calcutta alone, so many big projects are going on. And when we look at New Delhi also, in New Delhi also there's so many big projects. You have um, Rohini, and Dwarka, you know, all different parts of Delhi, in the outskirts, in different regions. Fourteen the, temples, Maharaj. Huh? Fourteen huh? temples in the prison in Delhi. Fourteen. Yeah. Oh, and and not small, quite big temples, no, yeah, right? Yeah, medium and big. 
Uh, medium, of course, Chipiwada is maybe smaller. That's small. Uh, yeah, and that's Prabhupada's original place there in Old Delhi. But still a very important place that Prabhupada personally worked there and resided there. So we, we have a, a lot of projects going on and we how to do it, you know, we don't have so many people who are so wealthy, so we have to go and, and preach and we have to get people to support these projects. We need people to give their, uh, to give their might, <laughs> to give their wealth for the service of Krishna. So sometimes people may criticize our movement that we're always, you know, we're always after money. <laughs> yeah, well, of course we need money. But we're not only after money, we do a lot of other things also. And we do see that, uh, for example, when we had the, when we had the COVID, when the COVID was really strong, and when there was lockdown, the devotees were doing a lot of service. They were going out, distributing prasadam everywhere. They were taking risks to go around and give out food to people and try to help people. And so here in Mayapur also, we had, we had a van going out every day distributing food in the villages to people because there were so many people in need. And we do try, we do try our best to help, although we're not really meant to be a social welfare institution, we do want to try our best to try to help people. It's ex ex expected that we should do something to help. So in, in the times of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, there was a famine and he was not inclined to help. They, come, they came to him to ask to help, but he was not inclined to help. And there was another time, there was a drought in Andhra Pradesh and they, the head of the drought, the the, the, the drought appeal, he wrote to Prabhupada asking, he said, you know, you're, you're the head of an international organization, you should give some money, can you give some money to help because so many animals and cows, there's there, there no food and there's no water, so can you help? So Prabhupada was not inclined to give financial support, but he told him, he said, actually you want rain, he said, you get rain when you do yagya. And he said, you should do the chanting of Hare Krishna mantra, and that will solve all your problems. And so Prabhupada had actually gone there to Hyderabad at that time, and the devotees had programs, and they did kirtan, and very soon they got rain. And so it was, it was uh, very big news that the Hare Krishnas had brought the rain to Andhra Pradesh to save everyone from the drought. But Prabhupada was showing us we, we have to preach, we have to preach and apply the philosophy. And so this is the duty of the Brahmanas. It's not that the, and Prabhupada in the light of the Bhagavad he talks, he said, the Brahmanas shouldn't think to become a Kshatriya or to become a Vaishya. You know, sometimes this happens, we see this sometimes, you know, people are doing the work of a brahmana, they're going out preaching somehow, but somehow they get deviated and they start to think they want to be a businessman, or they want to do the business. And they give up the brahminical work to take up Vaishya work. So that's not proper, that's not required. Prabhupada gives an example, he said, just like the wind is blowing the clouds, but the, the wind doesn't pour the water, it's the clouds which carry the water and pour the water. So everyone has to know what is their duty to be performed. So the duty of the brahmanas is, you know, this preaching work, to go to people and encourage them and get their interest and get them involved in helping the Krishna consciousness movement. Of course, it's, it's a difficult task. There are so many other things, there's so many other societies, so many other people. Oh, we're only one group. But I think 
how, how, how successful do you think we have been in this matter, in getting the support from the people for our Krishna consciousness movement? What would you say? Anyone? Do you, do you consider we've been successful in this? Yes, Maharaj. Certainly some regions have been more successful than others. Now, of course, in, in India, you have a, a good Hindu community and you, you do have uh, the potential for fundraising there because of all the, the, the people who are there who are believing in this Vedic culture and who would like to support it. And the followers also do much. Mm -hmm. The followers? Of ISKCON. What do you mean? We have... A, who got initiated in following Rindu to principles and... Oh, large, num large numbers of people, yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Uh-huh. Yes, uh, we, we do try to get uh, everyone involved in Krishna consciousness, even the students, we've had, we've done, we do a lot of programs, outreach programs, contacting the students, and sometimes also this is opposed. Sometimes the colleges, they don't like us coming there on the campus and canvassing for their students, taking them away from Krishna consciousness. But we do try. We do try to keep everybody somehow involved in Krishna consciousness. We try to keep the doors open for everyone, whatever ac activities, whatever interests they have, we try to bring them in and get them to engage in Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada, when Prabhupada first came to India, the devotees were going to just do the book distribution. But of course Prabhupada understood this is not a very good idea to go out on book distribution on the streets of India in a city like Calcutta or Mumbai or somewhere and you go out and try to sell a book for a few rupees from people. This, this is, there's already so many vendors on the streets there. So Prabhupada himself got the idea that we should have this life membership program and in this way get people to engage, engaging their Lakshmi in the service of Krishna. And the idea was that people would also get the books, that they would be given the full set of all the books. So later on that changed because it was difficult for the devotees to provide all the books for everyone. And we, we, we did encourage people, we told them that you could get guest house facilities, come and stay in our temples. And Prabhupada liked that, he liked that, but of course it has to be properly organized, properly arranged. We don't have guest houses everywhere. It's difficult to provide facilities in all of our different centers. But in India, certainly, it seems to be done quite well. We see, for example, Mayapur and Vrindavan, they do have many guest rooms and they do get a lot of visitors. And generally, they do re respect a life member. And they will give him, like, I think it's three days a year, they can stay free. And so this is, this is the brahmanas, they're meant to inspire people. We're meant to inspire people to contribute their, their wealth for the Krishna consciousness movement. And then we're meant to also perform sacrifices and distribute wealth equally. So what does that mean? How can we distribute wealth equally? There will be different needs for different people. Not everybody has the same needs. 
Now some people will be, be there can live in a very simple, a very frugal manner, and other people, they'll live on a, a different level. Just like, for example, someone's a businessman, he's not going to live like an ordinary worker. And, for example, the clothes which they keep, the wardrobe. Someone's a businessman, he will need suits. He will have to have a few suits at least. He has to go to office, he has to meet people, meet customers and so on. He has to dress appropriately. Where somebody else is just a factory worker, he's just maybe on the shop floor or a laborer, so he, he doesn't, of course he would dress in a very simple, casual clothes. So we have to recognize the needs of people in different positions. We cannot expect that the the big, the, the big Vaishyas will live on the same manner, at the same scale as the Sudras. But there should be respect for each other. There should be that cooperation. In Srila Prabhupada's time, there was one man in New Delhi. He had a factory producing, I think it was electric light bulbs. And he was very interested in Krishna consciousness. And Srila Prabhupada told him he wanted to make his whole factory Krishna conscious. And Prabhupada actually outlined the plan. And Prabhupada said, we will send devotees there every day and they will do kirtan and they will also give class on Bhagavad Gita. He said, so get all the workers to come every day, every morning before they begin work, there should be kirtan and then there will be a short class on the Bhagavad Gita. This was Prabhupada's idea for giving Krishna consciousness to, in, in an industry, in a, an industrial environment. It didn't really happen, it somehow things just disintegrated. But that was Prabhupada's thinking. Prabhupada certainly, he, he wanted to do these things. He was always thinking, he had all these plans, ideas about how to introduce Krishna consciousness in all these different situations. So this is the Brahmana. The Brahmana is always thinking how to engage people in the service of Krishna. And the, the Brahmana shouldn't think of himself as being better than others. But he, he must be caring and compassionate for others and offering respects to others also. So this is a problem in the Kali Yuga. Getting these people, getting everybody to work together without discrimination, without thinking high class, low class, but simply seeing everyone as a servant of Krishna. All right, are there any questions or comments on this? Yes, Maharaj, uh, could I ask a question? Please. So Maharaj, uh, according to Varnashan system, the Brahmins, they can accept the charity. So when somebody is accepting somebody's money, so it's not just the money, but he's accepting the karmas also. And a Brahmana has to be strong enough to digest those karmas. He should be spiritually potent. Uh, now we are also collecting funds for the temple. So I just want some clarification here, Maharaj when we are collecting for the temples and usually the wealthy class they earn money some by some inappropriate means so does it have a, a consequence or reaction on the community where it is collected so Maharaj, could you throw some light on this yes well yes certainly people doing business often you, they they get their money by some often quest, questionable means but if the money goes to Krishna and is used for Krishna to establish a temple, then nobody's going to be affected because all the money belongs to Krishna. It's all Krishna's money. It's all meant for his service. So that's the idea that whatever donations, whatever contributions we receive, whatever way in which the money came, it may be questionable or not, but the money should all be used 100% for Krishna. 
nothing for sense gratification, nothing for herself. It's all for Krishna to build the temple. We have the example in the past, I think long ago it was uh, the Alwars, in the time of the Alwars, there was a, they were going, there was a thief, or, or there was the guru of the temple had disciples who were thieves, and they would go out and steal, and they'd bring the money to use it to build the temple, so they could finish the temple. <laughs> Sri Rangam huh? Temple. And Sri Rangam Temple, was it Prabhu? Okay. And so the Sri Rangam Temple was completed in that way by some thieves. The problem was that once the temple was built, the Guru said, okay, you can stop stealing now. But th they had a problem, they couldn't stop. Because they get so accustomed to stealing and so on, they don't want to stop. So this is one of the dangers. We get so contaminated by this activity. And they, you have to be very careful. And so people also, they're doing questionable means, they do business by some questionable means, they get the money and they give some of it to Krishna. But, of course, they're, they still go on and do their questionable means, their business is still done, so they get karma, because they're taking a lot of the money for their own self, for their own sense gratification. But if they give some of it for Krishna, it's certainly for their benefit, even though they got it by some dishonest or inappropriate means, that if they're giving it to Krishna, it's, for their, it's to their credit, because all the money belongs to Krishna. Lakshmi is the property of the Lord, and it's all meant for His service. And so our job is to bring that Lakshmi back to Krishna, right? Just like Lord Rama went to bring Sita, to get Sita back from Ravan. The problem, all the Lakshmi is in the hand of so many Ravans. <laughs> the Ravans have taken all the control, they've got all the money, we have to get them. We have to somehow get them to give the money for Krishna. Prabhupada told us that we, when we collect money, we should be very careful that nothing should be used for our own sense gratification, but everything must be used for Krishna, totally. And then there won't be any karma. That is the idea. Is that... Yes? Uh, sometimes some grastas they ask that can we take some things, money in it? legal way and then donate, donate it to temple. So rather than saying no to illegal money, we can take illegal money and we can donate it to temple. Is that all right? Illegal money, they're giving it to the temple. Uh, miss, they can say no also, but they're saying rather than saying no to that illegal money, we can accept that illegal money and then we will donate it to temple. So is that all right? Many times they ask this question. Yes, if they, they, sh they, sh if they give all the money to the temple, Maharaj. They should give all the money to the temple. If they... Uh, Maharaj, they, they are many times ready for that also. They say that now we'll give whole money to the temple. Uh, so rather than saying no, can we do that? Yes, can do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes? Maharaj, yes, I mean, to this comment when Anand Gangsundar Prabhu said and like responded, I have a fear that that might get the temple in the long run into deep trouble. Say, for example, the, the guy is caught and oh. he says that, that the money is, is being given to ISKCON temple. So then he become a party to that uh, criminal, uh, you know, like, uh, oh. yeah, and we, we might we might be fined or we, we might be a party to that. Oh, oh, oh so, yeah. might set a very dangerous precedence. Oh, encouraging yeah. such people. Huh? Thank you so much. Encouraging such people might set a very dangerous, dangerous precedence because once you start it, you don't know where to stop. Uh huh. Yes, that's a problem. That one, so that's a problem. Once you start, they don't know when to stop. Yes, Prabhu? Uh, Maharaj, I have this experience with the devotees. Like in uh, coal fields, some uh, uh, public sector, in that they are forced to take the, uh, you know, some percentage commission is a bribe but it will be shared to all the officers if one person is not taking the other people will take revenge on him because he may say anytime anytime he may he may reveal to some other people 
and they will be scared of this one person and they will be treating in a in a you know bad way like so mm. better to accept that otherwise he will be in a bad you know in a blacklist like uh -huh. Uh -huh. and uh, if if anything is going to happen then whole whole system will be uh, caught and that will not happen like that mm. so what what do you suggest prabhu what you said accept and give it to krishna yes yes but not to make a habit of it right but but it is we, we uh, that person has to do it maharaj otherwise oh. he cannot survive there oh i see yeah, huh, huh. so what do you say prabhu you cannot, cannot preach there what about the you other you cannot be friendly with anyone there mm -hmm. he is not accepting yes so what about the prabhu who said we may be a problem for the temple what do you say prabhu I'm saying the same thing, Maharaj. Like that might be case for that place, and that he basically is saying that everybody is part party to it. So then, like, let everybody has a share to that black money. But the temple doesn't have to be part of the black money. That will not be. Temple will. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be. I mean, it's not that, that, that he should bring this money and like uh, keep it at the doorsteps of the temple, saying that because I'm earning this black money by force, so you take it and then. Later on, some another day when there is a black day for everybody, the iskon is also one of it. See, the person if if twenty people are caught taking bribe, doesn't make a news. But again, iskon center is caught taking black money, that makes a big news. So I won't take my chances. Well, with that. the idea, the point is when people give donations, of course we we give them the receipt, right? The money. Yes, you can't give the receipt on the black money. Well. Then how you can use the money if it's you know if you can't give the receipt you can't show the money on the accounts. That's the point I'm saying. So then like that's a very dangerous precedent. He well, brings the money by hook or crook, and then he gives he he gets a receipt from you. Well, that means we are um, uh, putting the black money back into the system. I know what happened some time back. Uh, maybe you remember Indira Gandhi was the prime minister, and she declared overnight. One thousand rupee note is illegal; is no more. Yeah. Right. One. So many people had thousand rupee notes. So what did they do with them? So what? The, one thing which they did: many people came wanted life membership. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and other people, they come, they put the money. Like the Tirupati Balaji Hundi had a lot of money. The Hundi at Tirupati, they got oh, lakhs and lakhs. So much money was there. Because that time, all the thousand rupee notes, they all came, they threw it into Balaji. So that's other way that you put the money in the hundi. The money in the hundi, we've no control over. We just open the hundi, we take the hundi. We don't know how it got there or where it came from. Just, yeah, that's all right. I mean, that people is not going to question that. But if we give receipts to those people who are taking that money, that person is called the other dad. He says, I, 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 I. I take the black money for the black man inside the temple. It's called Krishna. That's gonna not going to land Krishna into trouble, but the temple president into trouble. Everything will become white when it touches. It doesn't you. become white like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Try that in your temple, Prabhu. You have my best wishes. Sorry. I'm saying to Srinivas Gopal Prabhu, he, he can try in his own temple. He and he will have all my best wishes uh -huh. because he will need a lot of that. Mm, but you wouldn't do that in your temple, huh? I mean, I won't suggest my temple getting caught and have, making him news in Delhi. Uh huh. <laughs> so people come and offer you money. Sometimes you refuse it. No, they, but the bhundi is a different thing. But I cannot give him a receipt for that. Of yeah, course. <laughs> Well, that's the point, that there are ways around it, right? Yeah, that's different. So you have to, have to be intelligent about these things. Hmm. You want to continue discussing topic, please stop recording. Okay. No, <laughs> yes, they're very confidential <laughs> things, right? <laughs> Not things we want everybody to hear. Uh, what do you say, Maharaj? Should I pause recording? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I leave it to you, Prabhu. I, yeah, I'm, I'm only speaking for the... If, if the topic is going to continue, please pause recording and please make sure that this recording is recording also... Recording stopped. Oh.
Okay, we'll take we'll take we'll take a break. It's time for the break. Let's have our Gayatri break. We'll break for ten minutes. We'll be back in ten minutes. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes, okay, so we're going on. Let's go to text number 25. Recording in progress. Text number 25. When the Vrindavan forest had thus become resplendent, filled with ripe dates and jambu fruits, Lord Krishna, surrounded by his cows and cowherd boyfriends and accompanied by Sri Balaram, entered that forest to enjoy. So this is Lord Krishna's mood. Lord Krishna, of course, is the, the reservoir of all pleasure. And he comes, he, he's the supreme enjoyer. And one of the ways in which he enjoys, which is very dear to his heart, is in the Vrindavan forest with all the cowherd boys and with the cows and enjoying the beauty of the forest as described here with the different date, uh, fruits like dates and jumbo fruits. And, and we heard how it was so colorful. So those cowherd boys, they're actually his eternal associates from the spiritual world. They've come to take part in his pastimes there in Vrindavan. And that Vrindavan, of course, is the replica of Vrindavan, Goloka Vrindavan in the spiritual world. So Lord Krishna is enjoying the beauty of the forest. This is how to enjoy, you see, to, to enjoy, it's not that we have to have a lot of things, we can enjoy the beauty of nature and the, the cows, of course, as well, a very important part of nature. Because this planet is actually the property of the cows. This is this cow, the, the presiding deity of the earth planet is Mother Bhumi, and she's in the form of a cow. So this, the cows actually belong to this planet, and they're very important. We have to take care of the cows. The, the cows are domestic creatures. They need us, and we need them. Just as much as they need us, we need them also, because they provide the most valuable foodstuffs. And without milk, then we can't get ghee. And without ghee, there's no yagya. So how can we perform sacrifices without cows? Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 26. The cows had to move slowly because of their weighty milk bags. But they quickly ran to the Supreme Personality of Godhead as soon as he called them. Their affection for him causing their udders to become wet. And Srila Prabhupada comments, the cows being fed by new grasses became very healthy and their milk bags were all very full. When Lord Krishna called them by name, they immediately came to him out of affection. And in their joyful condition, the milk flowed from their bags. So this is the condition of the cows in the time of Lord Krishna. When the cows are given proper love and care, then they provide so much milk. They're so happy. They will give the milk freely. And so much milk that the, even the, the, field, the fields would be flooded with milk. So this was the condition of the planet in the time of Lord Krishna. Going ahead, text number 27. The Lord saw the joyful Aborigine girls of the forest, the trees dripping sweat sap, and the mountain waterfalls whose resounding ind indicated that there were caves nearby. So the Aborigine girls, the... Uh, Native girls, they're sometimes mentioned in the pastimes of Lord Krishna. We'll hear about them when we go on to the Venu Gita, because there's some incidences, some verses there, talking about the Aborigine girls and how they were also affected by Lord Krishna and his flute playing. 
So again, Sukadeva Goswami is describing the beauty of the forest, the trees dripping sweet sap, and the mountain waterfalls. So you can imagine how wonderful the whole place must have been. We hear about that also, Govardhan. In Govardhan, there was also waterfalls. Now, of course, not. But in the past, like that. Text 28. When it rained, the Lord would sometimes enter a cave or the hollow of a tree to play and to eat roots and fruits. So, in the course of the autumn season, sometimes it would rain also. The rainy season just finishing, coming to an end. So the rain would be not so much, but sometimes it would rain. And when it would rain, then go into the cave and take shelter. And Lord Krishna would enjoy eating some of the, the kunda and mula roots and the pala, the fruits. So these things were growing naturally. The roots were growing. There were two different kinds of roots. Uh, one was under the ground and one was uh, a little bit above the ground. It just had a bit of the, the root in the ground. And one was fully under the ground. But Lord Krishna in the, in the, said in the rainy season and at the end of the rainy season, then these roots would be very nice to eat. And Lord Krishna would enjoy to eat these things, roots and fruits. You know, children, they enjoy to eat these kind of things. So they go in the cave or the hollow of a tree to play and to eat. Sanatana Goswami explains this, that during the rainy season, bulbs and roots are very tender and palatable, and Lord Krishna would eat them along with wild fruits found in the forest. Lord Krishna and his young boyfriends would sit in the hollow of a tree or within a cave and enjoy pastimes while waiting for the rain to stop. And then text 29 describes more about what Lord Krishna would eat for his meal coming out for the day, he'd leave in the morning, they'd all go out together, all the cowherd boys, they'd go out and take the calves with them. And so they would bring their lunch box with them. So Lord Krishna is described here, he would take his meal of boiled rice and yogurt sent from home in the company of Lord Sankarshan and the cowherd boys who regularly ate with him. They would all sit down to eat on a large stone near the water. So Lord Krishna, you can see he's eating food, very appropriate for that place. Yogurt, of course, there'd be a lot of yogurt there in Vrindavan because his father has so many cows. And so with so many cows, there'd be so much milk. And with all that milk, they'd make some yogurt. So Lord Krishna would eat rice and yogurt, very cooling in the hot weather. So Lord Krishna would eat that kind of food. We know we, we offer to Lord Krishna every day when cooking for Krishna. Lord Krishna likes to eat rice and dal and chapati and samjis and these things. But here Lord Krishna is in the field in the summertime. So he's taking rice and yogurt. And it was like that, Lord Brahma, it was described in earlier pastime, Lord Brahma was observing Lord Krishna and he saw Lord Krishna with the, <coughs> with the ball of yogurt in his hand, yogurt rice in his hand, in his left hand, right? This guy, he was holding the, the yogurt rice in his left hand, so Lord Brahma saw the situation and Lord Brahma was surprised that, that he is my Lord and Master and he's eating simple food like this, you know, rice and yogurt, very simple fare, but very satisfying for the stomach, definitely. If you have 
if, if we have problems with the stomach, we eat, sometimes eat too much oily food and too much spicy food, we can easily get stomach problems. But Lord Krishna enjoys, as a child, he enjoyed naturally milk, uh, uh, yogurt rather, yogurt and rice, boiled rice. So it's very cooling for the body in the hot season. So we're hearing the rainy season pretty much finished, not quite, just about finished. Okay, text 3031. Lord Krishna watched the contented bulls, calves and cows sitting on the green grass and grazing with closed eyes. And he saw that the cows were tired from the burden of their heavy milk bags. Thus observing the beauty and opulence of Vrindavan, There's a hint here. What's the the arrangement? Rasa. Yeah? Govardhan. Rasa. rasa. Yes, the rasa dance, right. The rasa dance is coming up. The rasa dance is going to be described. That's coming up in a few chapters. You'll hear Lord Krishna's rasa dance, which is Krishna's own internal potency. So everything has to be arranged for that, that, for the pleasure pastimes of Lord Krishna. Right, Krishna comes here to enjoy. Krishna doesn't come here to kill the demons. That's made very clear. To kill the demons, Krishna can do that anyway. He can do that easily with his different potencies. He doesn't have to do that himself. But he comes here personally for the purpose of pleasing his devotees, giving pleasure to all of his devotees. That's ve very important. Lord Krishna wants to please all of his devotees. And this is uh, the greatest pleasure for Lord Krishna, being with, of course, the gopis. And to 
enhance these pastimes, there has to be the suitable place. And the best place in all the creation is Vrindavan. And the best time of the year is also that Sarat season. So you will hear that coming up to the Sarat season and the time for the Rasa dance, all perfect for enjoyment, for Lord Krishna to enjoy in the company of all of his confidential devotees. So this is the nature of Krishna's pastimes. Okay, we'll go ahead, text 32. While Lord Rama and Lord Keshava were thus dwelling in Vrindavan, the fall season arrived, when the sky is cloudless, the water clear, and the wind gentle. Okay, so the rainy season has come and gone, and now we're in the fall, or we would call it the autumn. Right? The sky is cloudless, the water clear, the wind gentle. Quite a transformation from the rainy season. Text 33 describes the autumn season, which regenerated the lotus flowers, also restored the various bodies of water to their original purity, just as the process of devotional service purifies the minds of the fallen yogis when they return to it. So the indication here is that someone may be practicing yoga and they may at some point become disturbed may become mentally agitated, some problem somehow or other comes up within their mind, and they may give up their practice, they may give up their spiritual practice. But then after some time, they again come back. So we see that phenomena. Those of you who are managing centers in Krishna consciousness, I'm, I'm sure you have to deal with this from time to time people, devotees, for some time, and sometimes they have some, you know, they're not fully prepared, and they may go away for some time, and then after some time they again come back. Do you have, any, any of you, you have this experience with you, some of your devotees? Do you allow them to come back? Are you accommodating when people give up devotional service and they go off for some time? Do you welcome them back into the community again when they return? Yes, Maharaj. Yes? Any any conditions? Do you make any adjustments? No conditions. Oh. If he starts practicing, then gradually we do conditions. Uh -huh. And uh, do you find that generally it's successful? If somebody goes away, comes back, generally once they come back they'll be more serious? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, I think so. I think sometimes people just need more time to mentally prepare themselves to enter into a kind of monastic life. It's not so easy sometimes to live in an ashram. There can be many challenges and certainly, you know, there will be doubts which come in the mind and then we have also attachments, different con uh, family affairs and so on. So we may, we may have to leave for some time, but then we decide that actually the life I want is actually there, and they will come back. So this example is given here, this, we see this in nature, that the, the, in the autumn season, the lotus flowers restored the various bodies of water to their original purity. So in the rainy season, the water is all muddy and mixed with so many things, it's not so clear. 
But then when the autumn comes and the rains stop, then the water becomes more pure. So it's described like that, devotion, devotional service purifies the minds. Prabhupada was always very accommodating people who left the movement and Prabhupada would always encourage them to come back. And of course when you come back, what is the proper atonement? Just simply take up devotional service. There's nothing more to be done. Just simply take up devotional service. That is the actual atonement. We don't have to do anything else. And just continue. And devotional service is not lost. Whatever service we've done in the past, that's to our credit. So we have to go on from where we left off. All right. We'll go ahead. Text number 34. Autumn cleared the sky of clouds. Let the animals get out of their crowded living conditions, cleaned the earth of its covering of mud, and purified the water of contamination in the same way that loving service rendered to Lord Krishna frees the members of the four spiritual orders from their respective troubles. So this is an, an interesting verse. We want to look at this, right? Uh, autumn cleared the sky of clouds. All the rain had fallen, so the clouds became, you know, white clouds, no more black clouds, no more rain clouds. And let the animals get out of their crowded living conditions. Why would the animals be in crowded living conditions? Someone like to say? Yes. Can I speak? Please. Because when uh, rains are there, the, they can't sit here and there on the fields, which are very, very wet. But now because rains are gone, they, have, they can sit at places in the fields also. Especially cows have a lot of difficulty when uh, rains are there. Mm. You don't have places to sit. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and also sometimes some parts of the world it's very cold. Uh, sometimes they, they have to take the animals into the barn, bring them in the barn, so their movements will be restricted. Maybe it will be even crowded in the barn. So like that, sometimes. But once the autumn comes, then they get out and they're happy to get their freedom. And then the next example is given about clean the earth, clean the earth of its covering of mud. Autumn cleaned the earth of its covering of mud. Of course, with the rain, naturally, there'd be a lot of mud. But when the autumn comes, then that mud will dry. It's going to become dry and become firm again. In the time of the rain, when it's rainy, it's muddy everywhere, it's slippy, dangerous. But once the rains go, and then everything becomes dry, and the earth becomes hardened. So this was autumn purifying. And then the third thing, purified the water, the water of contamination. So the water of, of contamination that is due to the rainy season again, that the water... Uh, all the mud in the bottom of the, the the bed of the lake or the river, all the mud will come up and we'll see the water very dirty looking in the rainy season. But after the rainy season, in the autumn, then everything settles down and the water also becomes clear, no more contamination. So this is compared to loving service rendered to Krishna frees the members of the four spiritual orders from their respective troubles, right? Brahmacharis, what kind of trouble does a brahmachari have? You know, those of you who are probably grihastas, you think brahmachari, they don't have any troubles, huh? Does brahmachari have trouble? Who, who should, we should ask 
Who is the Brahmachari Srinivas Gopal Prabhu? Do Brahmacharis have troubles? Yes, Maharaj. What troubles they have? First, staying uh, as a Brahmachari in Brahmachari Ashram is the biggest problem. <laughs> so you have to maintain, you have to be protected, we have to be protected ourselves. Uh -huh. okay. And, uh, and uh, we, we, like, when the Grihasthas, they invite, we have to eat, we have to accept, and um, we, we may get contaminated our consciousness. Oh. But it's really new, newly, if somebody comes, if they invite us, and for the sake of preaching, we go and do the prayer, uh, kirtan and all that, then we have to accept some prasadam from there. Oh, we have to accept prasadam from there. It may not be up to our standards. Hmm. And you may not be hungry, you may not be wanting, it may not be the right yeah. time for you to eat. And uh, sometimes they forcefully feed us and we have to take Yes, right. Okay, so that's a that's a <laughs> that's a, a minor austerity, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Okay. That's that's one trouble from the brahmacharis. Anybody else like to talk about brahmachari troubles? Brahmachari feels Maharaj emotional <clears throat> support. He feels alone in the ashram. He feels that he needs a company. So uh -huh. He's looking for a partner. So that's one problem. Maharaj. Looking for a partner. He feels alone. Uh -huh. He doesn't feel any privacy. Uh, yes, of course, you have to live like that. Space. Brahmachari, you don't have any privacy. Right? You live in the ashram. He doesn't find his space. But Maharaj, Delhi Brahmachari Ashram is the royal Brahmachari Ashram. Really? All the are provided. No, really? <laughs> Okay, and it's mentioned here actually, it's here. one of the problems for the brahmachari is that, you know, people all get the brahmacharis to do it. And the brahmachari is like the worker, you know, it's like the, the servant, he has to do everything, the cleaning, he has to clean up after everyone, and he has to go for the, you know, have to get water, maybe he's the one to go and get the water, bring the water. You know, he has to accept all of this kind of menial service. Brahmacharis often are given that, these kind of things to do, you know, the menial service, the, the cleaning and the, the uh, carrying and this like this. So this is sometimes difficult, becomes a problem for the Brahmacharis. But as the, as the Brahmachari becomes more established and more advanced, more senior, then naturally he won't have to do these things. So that's the idea, that as one becomes more surrendered and becomes more engaged in Krishna consciousness, then he won't be so much, it won't be so much of a problem for him. And if he's actually in Krishna consciousness, he won't mind to do all of these different menial services. It's actually mentioned here in the, in the, in the purport, it says, a brahmachari must perform many menial duties during his student life. But as he becomes advanced in loving service to Krishna, his, superior, his superiors recognize his spiritual status and elevate him to the higher duties. The innumerable obligations performed on behalf of... Oh, no, that's the, that's the grihastas, right? So what about grihastas? What what are the difficulties for the grihastas? What are the troubles for people in grihasta ashram? From beginning to end, everything is difficult only. <laughs> From beginning to end, uh, um, okay, yeah, maintaining the process of getting married. <laughs> the that's the trouble, getting married. <laughs> Of course, it's a big trouble. Mm, we are, well, find, we find the right boy, we think, to find the right girl. We hear the, the glorious householders. We thought the greatest <laughs> ashram is glorious. Yeah, because because they tolerate all the trouble and that still continue with the household life, they become glorious householders. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, because we are in Krishna conscious, it is very glorious. 
glorious. Yes, right. Without Krishna consciousness, then it would be a lot of trouble. But in Krishna consciousness, certainly very glorious. Householders. But Maharaj, yes. Uh, before getting married, one devotee told me, uh, Prabhu, after getting married, this Girhastha Ashram will make you a purified. So now I understand why that devotee uh, told me, every moment I am purifying Maharas. You're getting purified every moment? Yes, Maharas. Oh, very so nice. Those Girhastha uh, uh, Ashram, they understand what is purification. Oh, very nice. Purification, okay. And the, that Bhaktivinoda Thakur certainly was Grihastan. You know, he thinks about it, he's written about it. Yedina Grihe Bhajana Deke Griheti Golokabaya. He says, when I'm worshipping my deity at home, then my home becomes Goloka, becomes a spiritual world. And so, you know, it's not always the, the Griha under Kupam. Prahlad Maharaj told his father, Hiranyakashipu, to leave the home because it was a blind well. But that was Hiranyakashipu. He was a materialistic demon. But for the devotee, the family life is very glorious. And it's, uh, it, you know, the idea is to be a grihasta, not a grihamedi. That's the point, right? Grihamedi, of course, there will be trouble. But grihasta life is very nice. You can enjoy. So it's, you can enjoy Krishna consciousness together. You can practice Krishna consciousness together. Help each other. When Prabhupada, when Prabhupada saw couples get married, he'd tell them, now you can do twice as much service together. You help each other in your service. The husband helps the wife and the wife helps the husband. So it says here, the innumerable obligations performed on behalf of wife and children, constantly harass a householder. But as he becomes advanced in loving service to Krishna, he is automatically elevated by the laws of nature to more enjoyable spiritual occupations. And he somehow minimizes material duties. So this is how it's described here. You have to minimize your material duties, maximize your spiritual duties. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh -huh. One person joined, uh, one boy joined from Bengali community. He was saying that uh, after the training finished, he, he has decided that I want to join in the Griyastha Ashram. Why? Then he said that Brahmacharis means they, they have to live like Das. And Grihastas means like boss they can. <laughs> oh. oh, really? <laughs> that's an illusion. Yeah, I think I think that's yeah, I think that's also an illusion. I would agree. Yeah. Usually, uh, you're going to live together and enter into householder life. It's a partnership. It's not you're the boss. Oh, they, they feel that, you know, I am feeding you. Even they feed the God also. Mm. But there has to be that mutual respect, you know, the wife. Yeah, of course, usually they say uh, when if there's any disagreements at home, if you want to have a peaceful life, then you have to know wife is always right. <laughs> So if, if you can get that right, if you remember your wife is always right, then your home can be peaceful. And usually wife is right, you know, she can, you know, women can be very Krishna conscious, it can help a lot to the men. Men tend to get too much entangled in the material things. And sometimes, sometimes the, the wife helps the husband to see the light. So co cooperation is there. It's very important. Ideal family life is one of the chapters there in the seventh canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. We want to encourage the devotees in spiritual life that family life is not the blind well, but it's ideal family life. Ideal family life. Grihasta. 
It's an ashram. It's a shelter. And entering into Grihastha life, one should remember that it's not eternal, that you move on. You become a Grihastha, and after some time, then you can also become Vanaprastha. You don't have to remain Grihastha all the, the whole life. We should also retire from the, the family duties. So the successful Grihastha ashram, they, they will move on into the next ashram, to the, the Vanaprastha. And that, that training should be there from, from the beginning. From the beginning, they're, they're trained as a brahmachari, you get good training as a brahmachari, and you understand how to properly live as a grihastha. Without proper brahmachari training, then it would be difficult to be a good grihastha. But if the good basic is there in the beginning, if one has had a good brahmachari training, then it makes it a lot easier to be a grihastha. The good brahmachari will make a good grihastha. And then the grihastha, they will also move on to become vanaprastas. And they may even eventually, it may even eventually go and take sannyas. You don't know. So this is the Vedic system. All right, so then vanaprastas. Vanaprastas, what's the difficulty for them? Mm, well, vanaprastas, their duty is to actually perform some austerities. And we read about them growing their hair and growing their nails and like that, not cutting their hair, not cut, cutting their nails and very uh, great austerities, controlling their food, limiting their food. So those in the Vanaprastha or retired order of life also perform many duties and these can also be replaced by ecstatic loving service to Krishna. So Vanaprastha, uh, it, it's not a prominent ashram in our society, but it, it should be there. There are Vanaprastas. They don't usually advertise themselves as such as being Vanaprastas, but they are there. And it's a, it's an, it, it's important. Srila Prabhupada went went through the different ashrams, but Srila Prabhupada only changed his ashram with great reluctance. He was very cautious, and he prepared himself before he moved on. He didn't do anything prematurely. He was in Grihastha life, and then he entered Vanaprastha. And then finally he accepted also sannyas. So as sannyasis also there are difficulties. Right? What do you think of the difficulties for sannyas? Srinivas Gaur was talking about the invitations people bring you to their home. They want to feed you. They want to eat. They want you to eat their food. If you don't eat, they're not happy. And then you get people also coming and they touch your feet. They want to touch your feet all the time and take and give you their karma. You know, these are some problems, right? What are some other difficulties for sannyasis? Maharaj, they have to travel all this. Yes, right. Constantly traveling, no proper home, living in the airports or train stations or vans or buses, whatever. No fixed residence. It's not very easy. Prabhupada writes himself that it is certainly painstaking. It is painstaking. There's trouble there. So here it talks about uh, talks about the sannyasi that are inclined to meditate on the impersonal aspect of the absolute truth. It's, for those whose minds are attracted to them. But as soon as a sannyasi takes to preaching the glories of Krishna in every town and village, his life becomes a blissful sequence of beautiful spiritual realizations. So this is Krishna consciousness. In the autumn season, the sky returns to its natural blue color. Okay, so... 
in each of the ashrams there's some difficulties there but krishna consciousness can help us to overcome them we have to take shelter of devotional service it is by devotional service that we can overcome all of the obstacles Maharaj, can I ask a question? Please. Maharaj, regarding not cutting the nails and uh, growing the hairs, I always had a question that this would lead to uncleanliness. So how would person elevate in goodness if he doesn't cut his nails and grows the hairs? Yes. So, now, this is not an austerity which Srila Prabhupada encouraged in his God. When devotees ask Srila Prabhupada about doing this, this thing, Prabhupada said, this will just be sense gratification for you people. <laughs> he said, you people, he said, from the West, he said, this would just be sense gratification, growing long hair, not cutting the nails. He said, he, he didn't want that. But uh, the, there is some austerity there. The idea is to minimize minimize the demands of the body and the time we spend taking care of the body because we do can we, we can get absorbed in the material body we can spend a lot of time cutting the hair shaving the head and shaving the face and cutting the nails and so on we can spend a lot of time doing these things so the the attention the concentration becomes it comes on, more on the body but the idea is that we want to absorb ourselves in Krishna and thinking of Krishna, not thinking of the material body. This is the point. Maharaj, that is for Paramahamsas? Well, Paramahamsas, uh, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, a, it's an austerity. I don't know the Paramahamsas need to do austerity if somebody's already on that level of Paramahansa. <laughs> Does he need to do these kind of things? I don't know. Not, not need, but it automatically happens. They will not focus on bodily needs. They are not focused on the bodily needs, all right. Yeah. Uh, might be. Uh, certainly, uh, we don't encourage people to start advertising themselves that they're on the level of Paramahamsas. Mm -hmm. Generally, the Paramahansa, though, he won't travel and preach. The Paribrakacharya, they will travel and preach. Hmm. But the Paramahansa, he can sit down in one place. He's not going to travel. He'll just sit down in one place and he'll just chant and be Krishna conscious. So that's like the final stage of sannyas comes more like Bhaktivinoda Thakur at the end of life. He was just there in Jagannath Puri. He wasn't going anywhere. But actually I heard that he said, you should get a horse and put me on the horse and take me for preaching. So even though he was on the, on the final stage of life, he still had the desire to go out and preach. And Srila Prabhupada also encouraged like that. There was one time there were devotees, they uh, they brought vehicles from Germany, they brought a number of vehicles, good vehicles, Mercedes-Benz vehicles, they brought them over land and brought them to India to help in the preaching. Because in those days, in Prabhupada's time, there were no very, it was very difficult to get a good vehicle. So they brought the vehicles in and Prabhupada came to Vrindavan and he saw the vehicles were all sitting there at the temple. And Prabhupada said, what's happening? And they said, Prabhupada, it's Chaturmasya. We're observing Chaturmasya. And Prabhupada said, no, no. He said, you should keep, keep preaching. He said, keep going, going out. He said, you've got the transport, you should go out and preach. He didn't, he didn't want devotees just to stop everything and sit down and do, you know, just do their bhajan. And Prabhupada gave the example about the Indian railways. He said, keep the wheels rolling. He said in, in the Indian railways they have that motto that even the train comes late but keep the wheels rolling. And so even though he said it's the rainy season and it's difficult to travel but you should keep going, you keep travelling and go out and distribute books and do kirtan. He said you don't need to stop everything and just sit down and be here in Vrindavan. 
uh, another time a sannyasi said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I just want to be here in Vrindavan and, and chant Hare Krishna. And Prabhupada said, your duty is to give Vrindavan to others. He said, you have to travel and give Vrindavan to others, not to just enjoy it yourself. So like that, when we come to the holy place, it's not just for our own enjoyment, but it's to attract other people to take up devotional service. So, traveling, preaching is important. And of course, if you have long hair and long nails and things, then you know, it would be difficult to go for preaching. But this is more like for people who are recluse, who are in seclusion or something. You know, then they can they grow their hair, and they, they're, they're not cutting their hair, not shaving their face, they're not cutting the nails. They're just fully into bhajan, just chanting the holy name. But this is not what we really encourage in Krishna consciousness. Right? Okay, just to read a little bit from the purport here at the end. Uh, the autumn season, but the autumn season single signals the time for the animals to go to their respective areas and live more peacefully. This represents a householder's becoming free from the harassment of family duties and being able to devote more of his time to spiritual responsibilities, which are the real goal of life, both for himself and his family. And then they talk, the removal of the muddy layer on the earth is like the removal of the inconveniences of vanaprastha life and the purification of water is like the sanctification of sannyas life by one's preaching the glories of Krishna without sex desire. All right, so very interesting purport, interesting verse there. We'll go ahead. Text 35. The clouds, having given up all they possessed, shone forth with purified effulgence, just like peaceful sages who have given up all material desires and are thus free of all sinful propensities. So the clouds have given up all they possessed. In other words, there's they're not rain clouds anymore, they're just white clouds. So they shone forth with purified effulgence, just like they're compared to peaceful sages who have given up all material desires and are free of all sinful propensities. So great sages, they should be without material desires. So what do we say? What's the verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita? Do you know that? About not having any desire? Krishna Bhakta Nishkama Ata Eva Shanta. Yes, right. Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami Sakale Ashanta. Right? Bhukti, those who, the karmi, he desires material sense gratification. And Mukti, the jnani, and desires liberation. And the yogi, he wants mystic powers. So none of these people are peaceful. But Krishna Bhakti Nishkam Sa Ishashant. The devotee, one who's doing Bhakti Yoga, he is peaceful. He has no material desire. He has desires, but his desires are spiritual, simply for the service of Krishna to dedicate everything in Krishna's service, using everything in the service of Krishna. That is pure spiritual desire. When the clouds, purport, when the clouds are filled with water, they are dark and cover the sun's rays, just as the material mind 
of an impure man covers the soul shining within. But when the clouds pour down their rain, they become white and, and then brilliantly reflect the shining sun. Just as a man who gives up all material desires and sinful propensities becomes purified and then brilliantly reflects his own soul and the supreme soul within. So you can see very nicely how they've taken the example uh, of the cloud being covered by the, or the, the, the sun being covered by the clouds and the rays of the sun coming through the clouds. So when the clouds pour down their rain, they become white and then brilliantly reflect reflect the sun's rays because there's no water in the clouds anymore the clouds are clear so the rays of the sun it's compared to just like a man who gives up all material desires and sinful propensities then he reflects his own soul and the supreme soul and the nature of the soul Satchit ananda bliss and knowledge. We heard earlier we were speaking about the false ego. So when the false ego is removed, then there's no more covering and the nature of the soul is actually manifest, brilliantly manifest. So in this way the devotee becomes beautiful. We did one other verse before, we were speaking about the beauty of the devotee because that's the nature of the soul. The, the soul is beautiful, the body is not beautiful, but the soul is beautiful. And the more we reflect the soul, the more the nature and qualities of the soul are manifest, then the more beautiful the person will be. All right, we just read one more. 36. During this season, the mountains sometimes released their pure water and sometimes did not. Just as experts in transcendental science sometimes give the nectar of transcendental knowledge and sometimes do not. This is an interesting analogy given that in the rainy season or during this season and it's autumn, the fall, after the rainy season. And so sometimes the water will come and sometimes it doesn't. So it's compared to people or experts in transcendental science that sometimes they speak and sometimes they don't. So they ask Prabhupada, what is this Prabhupada? Why is it like this? And Prabhupada simply explained, he said, it means He's not, it's not required. He may speak, he may not. He's not required. It's not that he must speak. It's up to him. If he feels like speaking, he will speak. If he doesn't want to speak, he will just be quiet. It's not required. It's not mandatory. So the first part of this chapter described the rainy season and the second part it's been dealing with the autumn season, which begins when the rain stops. During the rainy season, water always flows from the mountains. But during the autumn, the water sometimes flows and sometimes does not. Similarly, great saintly teachers sometimes speak expansively on spiritual knowledge and sometimes they are silent. The self-realized soul is closely in touch with the Supreme Soul and according to his desires, a competent spiritual scientist may or may not describe the Absolute Truth depending on the specific circumstances. So he's, it's, he's not required. It will depend on the inspiration coming from the Super Soul 
whether he should speak or whether not. Just like Srila Prabhupada would go for walks. And so sometimes he would speak and sometimes not. Sometimes he would just chant. Usually, actually, Prabhupada would walk in the morning, he would chant. It was a japa walk. But sometimes he would speak. Sometimes he would talk. But it's not required. Is it clear? So we're hearing about the autumn season. We've heard about the rainy season. Now we're into the autumn season. Krishna and Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram are enjoying in the forests of Vrindavan. They're enjoying the beauty of the forest and they have their cows also and their cows are fat and happy. They've been eating lots of nice grass, long grasses. Their milk bags are full. Everything is very pleasant. We're not hearing about any demons coming here in this chapter. It's all very nice, just enjoyment. Krishna is happy eating his rice and yogurt and fruits as well, dates and jamus and the roots, the mullahs and other roots there which grow. Everything is provided by nature. Sukadeva Goswami writes about that, or, or he speaks about that in the second canto Srimad Bhagavatam. He said, he, he says even, that, are there no torn clothes on the road? He said, you can lay down on the ground, the ground is flat, you don't need a bed, and you have arms, you don't need a pillow, and you get water from the river. <laughs> he said, and the same way here we're hearing Lord Krishna would eat the roots and the, the fruits from the trees and the roots which would grow. Everything's provided by nature. The cows are giving the milk. It's all over the fields. Their udders are full. The, the milk is dripping from their udders all over the fields. Everything is there. You want to get some milk? It certainly, you go to the bridge passes, they'll give you some milk. All right. Any questions or comments? Maharaj, I was, I was also thinking about Janabharat. He did not speak usually, but when uh, King Rahaguna offended him, he spoke about self-realization. Oh, yes. Very nice, right. Very nice example. Yes, Janabharat didn't speak. And similarly also Prahlad wouldn't speak. But when, when his class friends inquired from him, then he spoke. Right? And there's another example. Oh, no. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He did not speak to Sarabhama Bhattacharya for seven days. Just listen to him. Ah, yes. And then he explained Vedanta and you have Narada also, as a, when he was uh, serving the great sages. He was doing service for the sages and so they gave spiritual knowledge to him. They blessed him. Yes, yeah, so sometimes, sometimes they speak, Prahlad Maharaj, sometimes usually he wouldn't say anything but when he was with the, the other boys in the Guru Kul, he spoke to them. We read, there's one chapter there, Prahlad instructs his classmates about devotional service. So Prahlad was speaking and, and then of course Jad Bharat spoke extensively to Maharaj Rahugana because Maharaj Rahugana was so shocked that this, this man looked like somebody who was dumb and imbecile. But he was a great self-realized soul. So Maharaj Rahugan was really surprised. But they had the wonderful conversation. Yes. 
So, thank you very much for that, Prabhu. Very nice point. Yes, any other points? Okay, then we will finish here tonight. And tomorrow we'll go on, we can finish the chapter tomorrow. And we have to prepare to go on to the Venu Gita. So we'll see how the time goes, how long it takes us to finish this chapter tomorrow. Okay, so thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhus. Hare Krishna.